Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for having me here. Mr. Chairman of the International Legal Affairs Committee, Usama Malik, participants of the workshop, distinguished guests, speakers, members of the bar, Assalamu alaikum. I must say, I owe a debt of gratitude to this young organization the International Legal Affairs Committee of the Lahore High Court Bar Association. My compliments. You have coaxed me to pause and weigh on the very fundamentals that tie together our international legal order. It is while pondering over that order that I arrived at a stark realization. And that stark realization is that Pakistan's future as a responsible practitioner of international laws and a credible guarantor of the various treaties that it has ratified will be premised on the direction our legal community takes today. And I believe this is one of the steps that we need to take towards that direction. Seldom since the world wars has been the temptation to revert to our old bad ways being so clear and persistent. Just as it seemed a fragile global consensus when it was emerging. We've seen blurred borders. Look at the European Union. We've seen freedom of movement. We've seen freedom of international trade. Look at GATT. Look at other international treaties and conventions. We've also seen the forces of reaction undermine the consensus which has been built all over the world. There is, I feel, a reason behind this regression. And that regression is quite stark. International law tends to overwhelm us. We think of it as a threat to sovereignty of states. We look at Byzantine conventions and we shirk. The complex interplay between customs and treaties, the humbling of sovereign states before faceless super, supranational legal fora all add to the nation state's anxiety. As the equally revered and reviled Margaret Thatcher, she was the former Prime Minister of uh, England, she said about the European Union, and I'd like to quote that. It is in fact a classic utopian project, a monument to the vanity of intellectuals, a program whose inevitable destiny is failure. Mostly the same arguments have been said about the United Nations conventions the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, the ICSID, and other dispute resolution institutions. The very building blocks of our international legal regime that we see have also been criticized. And yet, even in the face of such sustained attacks, the growing primacy of international law has only endured. We would therefore be remiss to overlook this trend. Any conversation on the fundamentals of international law must begin with not only accepting, but also embracing the idea that we are a part of a large comity of nations. The fulfillment of our international obligations not only adds to our reputation on the world stage, but more importantly improves the quality of life of our citizen domestically and abroad. The only direction that the world spins, in my view, is forward. It just does not spin on its own axis, it spins forward. Those broad themes in mind, we continue. And we ought to continue on those premises. 
International law is a set of rules that regulate, or rather attempt to regulate, the relations between the states. Its preservation is enshrined in the very preamble of the UN Charter. And what does the UN Charter say? To establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained. This is what it says. The UN's own definition of international law has also reinforced the idea that it is both expansive and ever-changing, with concerns ranging from human rights, disarmament, international crime, refugees, migration, problems of nationality, the treatment of prisoners, the use of force, and the conduct of war. Now, this has been the traditional and the classic definition of international law. But we go on, because it is an ever-expanding area. Let's not restrict to the old definitions. At its heart, international law also serves to promote and protect the public interest across nation states, regulating the global commons, including the environment and the sustainable development. But whereas these are all high-sounding aims, the next question that arises is, what constitutes sources of international law? And that's the theme that we are surrounding here in my discourse today. To my mind, the best source would be not look here and there, but look at, the, look at what the United Nations Charter says about the International Court of Justice. Most of you, I'm sure, know that International Court of Justice is the primary organization, the primary institution for dispensation of dispute resolution between the nation states. What it does is it works on adversary jurisdiction and also inquisitorial. It advises international institutions. It is Article 38, one of the statute that has since gone on to become one of the most influential enumerations of international law in the world. Let me take you to what Article 38 one says. It says, ICJ apply to international conventions, whether general or particular, establishing rules expressly recognized by the contesting states, to international custom as evidence of general practice accepted as law, three, the general principles of law recognized by the civilized nations, fourthly, subject to the provisions of Article 59, judicial decisions and teachings of the most highly qualified publicists of the various nations as subsidiary means for the determination of rules of law. Hopefully, one day, it will also be a Pakistani publicist, a Pakistani lawyer, a Pakistani practitioner whose article or whose propoundance would also form part of that regime. For the first four source, international conventions or treaties are the most well-known instruments of international law, as enshrined in the Vienna Convention on the Laws of Treaties of 1969. Pakistan is a signatory thereof. On the other hand, such treaties are also the most well-known nightmares for domestic bureaucracies. Tasked with their implementation after such treaties have been ratified. On that note, may I add that the government of Pakistan established a treaty implementation cell in 2015 for precisely that purpose, to implement 27 core UN conventions ranging from Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women to the Evolution of Forced Labor Convention to the famous International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It would perhaps be relevant to mention that as soon as Pakistan demonstrated seriousness with regards to fulfilling its international obligations, 
the dividends were both immediate and wide-ranging. In response to the TIC's work, the European Union renewed its generalized system of preferences plus economic package allowing Pakistan duty-free access to European markets and acting as a boon to our otherwise stagnant export sector. Contrary to popular opinion, our social and economic progress is directly contingent upon our respect for international law and not in spite of it. The second source, international custom, is those generalized customs that have been used by ratifying states, both consistently and uniformly. Whereas the third source, general principles of law, are those that apply in the vast majority of legal systems. The final source is the haziest of them all, subsidiary means. That is not a source of it by itself, per se, but which substantiates the existence of a custom or general principle. These may well be UN resolutions or the most authoritative articles of leading law scholars on that specific subject. It should be noted that subsidiary means are ideally meant for supplementing other arguments rather than forming arguments on their own. There is also another principle of international law that no amount of legal wrangling can frustrate. And that is where I said it is an ever-evolving subject. And this principle is the principle of just cogens. In Latin, just cogens is a recognized maxim and principle of law. What it essentially means is compelling law. A form of written law, a form of convention, a form of authoritative discussion, which then becomes so compelling that no sovereign state can even take refuge behind their domestic legislation. This essentially revolves around and involves crimes against humanity. We've stopped talking about this, but this is one area where we need to work as a Pakistani nation, even harder, because the Kashmir issue is at the very core of this matter, which is contentious between India and Pakistan. Finally, the aspect of jurisdiction should always be considered at the forefront of any discussion on the fundamentals of international law. A state may well have jurisdiction of its own ter territories, but it can submit to the jurisdiction of the ICJ and other supranational law, law bodies via an array of mechanisms. The extent of its submission often depends on such mechanisms. An optional clauses declaration, for example, allows the state to accept jurisdiction of ICJ over restricted categories of disputes that other disputant states may have also affirmed. But then, can we live as an island? In this date and age, we cannot possibly stay aloof from, from the legal regime that we see internationally. Ladies and gentlemen, lack of time forbids me to delve any further. It may also be prudent to bring this address to an end before it becomes boring. A longer discussion may find us wandering out of the range of international law's fundamentals and into the range of micro issues of international law. Suffice to say that it is time to begin thinking of international law anew as a force for good and as swiftest means by which we not only bring the world closer together, but also bolster the destiny of our own very special country, Pakistan. Thank you for having me. I look forward to more of such stimulating institutions and organizations. Thank you again for suffering.